So I'd like to thank everyone and, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a lead portfolio analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are Kurt Murray and Carrie Quigley. Kurt is a principal at Assurance who focuses on mid-sized companies in the staffing industry. With over 20 years of experience, his primary client responsibility is to provide cost-effective solutions and develop insurance programs that are individualized to a company's specific needs. He deems it necessary to fully understand a client and their specific needs in order to properly develop their risk management program. Through this approach, Kurt generates valuable personal relationships with his clients to secure their trust. Carrie is a vice president who specializes in the staffing industry. With over eight years of insurance experience, Carrie has solidified her experience in providing in-depth coverage analysis, including the reconstructive of staffing industry products with Philadelphia, AIG, CNA, and Hanover Insurance. Her extensive knowledge of the industry is further augmented through various speaking and teaching opportunities including white papers and webinars on staffing liability exposures. Carrie also presented a general liability webinar for Assurance University and teaches CPCU and class code classes. Assurance is among the largest and most awarded independent insurance brokerages in the USA. Top 50 broker and repeated national best place to work winner. Assurance creates value by minimizing risk and maximizing health for 6,000 businesses and individuals across the country. The company is headquartered in Schaumburg, Illinois, with centralized offices located in Chicago, Illinois, and St. Louis, Missouri. The workers' compensation insurance rates can be long, bumpy, and expensive. A typical staffing submission is declined by more than 50% of insurance carriers. As a workers' comp is commonly the second largest expense for a staffing firm, it's imperative to compellingly position your business to obtain competitive quotes. In today's Industry Insider webinar series, Assurance Principal Kurt and Vice President Kerry will explain why the staffing industry is so difficult to underwrite, what underwriters are looking for, and how you can improve your operational profile to better present your business to them. We will, discuss, we will discuss how to understand which characteristics of your business impact your workers' compensation options, such as state and class code mix, learn how, to un, how underwriters interpret your claims results, review critical risk management practices, such as employee and client selection, safety training, and return to work programs and explore methods to improve your likelihood of receiving competitive quotes. By the end of today's session, you'll have learned how to position your staffing firm to clear the workers' compensation underwriting hurdles. With that, I will turn the floor over to Kurt and Carrie. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Tricom, for, for hosting this uh, webinar today. Uh, Carrie and I are excited to, for the opportunity to be able to present this to you, and we, we expect this to run just uh, right up to an, about an hour long, and if, if it runs a little bit late, we apologize, but we'll try to keep everybody on track time-wise. Uh, as Amanda said in the introduction, we're, we're going to walk you through some of the hurdles and challenges that we face as, as insurance brokers in trying to find you, uh, the staffing owner, uh, staffing agencies, workers' comp coverage. Uh, what underwriters typically like in the world is, is predictable predictability and profitability and control, and it's some of the things that inherently lack or are lacking in the staffing space. Uh, you may have a few hundred, several thousand employees. They change jobs on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes a weekly basis. Uh, they're moving from one client company of yours to another. You don't always know exactly what it is that your employees are doing day-to-day <clears throat> -day in 
some of the, those are some of the things that really scare underwriters. So the underwriting marketplace for workers' comp for staffing is significantly smaller than it is for general business. And that's one of the hurdles that we really need to overcome. Uh, what we're going to walk you through in the next 50 minutes is an overview of, of what underwriters are looking for, what you can and can't do with your business and what, with your operations, your risk management practices, and your, and your losses in order to best position yourself so that you can get the best result out of your workers' comp program. So we'll begin with going through um, what aspects of your operations and your business in general uh, underwriters are going to be looking at beyond um, the, the aspects you normally think of with claims um, and class codes, et cetera. So one of the thir first things that they're looking for is the length of time you've been operating in business. Because when you're underwriting workers' compensation, you're looking at historical results to be able to predict what future results are going to be. The experience that you have and the length of time and the underwriting data that you're able to provide to them is really critical for an underwriter to get a handle on um, understanding what to expect, what premium they need to set, what, what losses you're going to have. So that length of time in business is really important for them to get a, a grasp on how to predict future results. So typically they're looking for at least three years in business, uh, five years is preferred. Sometimes you can bridge that gap with maybe one or two years of experience uh, if we're able to point to a really good resume um, in the ownership or the management in the company and say, hey, they've been doing this for the past two years and we know we only have a year and a half experience, but here are the other things we can do to convince you that um, they have a tight control in this, they have familiarity in the industry, and this is something that you should take a chance on. One of the other things that dictates what insurance carriers are possibly a fit for writing your business uh, are the mix of states that you're in. So there's a limited number of insurance carriers that write coverage for staffing on a nationwide basis. Uh, beyond that, you have some additional options that are available if, if with regional insurance carriers if you're in only a handful of states, but um, the mix of states that you're in is important to determining what insurance carriers are, are, are comfortable and able to offer quotes. Um, in addition to an underwriter's or an insurance carrier's ability to provide coverage in a state, they may have different restrictions as far as states that they're actually willing to provide coverage, even if they're able to do it. Um, there are several factors that impact um, whether or not a state is desirable for them to do business in, um, one of which is what the average workers' compensation results are in that state. Are they typically higher than countrywide averages? The claims last longer in that state than they do in other states. Um, they're also looking at the regulatory environment. So what are you allowed to do with the handling of claims in that state? Are you able to be aggressive and make denials and, um, and really go to battle in situations where an insurance carrier should be battling for you, or are you sort of handcuffed by what um, the workers' compensation statutes in that given state allow you to do, which causes results to be poorer than, than other states with maybe a different regulatory environment? And then the other piece is um, what the insurance carrier is able to do with rating or pricing flexibility. Some states mandate that every insurance carrier has to use the same exact rates. Some states allow them to file for individual rates that they're comfortable using or have several sets of rates that they're able to utilize. Um, some have restrictions on whether you're able to use a scheduled credit or debit to, to change the pricing to where they feel comfortable providing a quote based on what the losses look like, and some states allow none of that flexibility, which can make it difficult for um, an insurance carrier to provide a quote where if there was maybe 10 or 15 percent more flexibility, they'd be willing to provide something. A piece that's really critical to determining what um, insurance carriers may be a fit and whether or not you'll receive a quote is 
your individual distribution of class codes and clients. So um, they're looking to see if you're in any particular class codes or industries that they find to be hazardous. And what in a particular insurance carrier is going to be find hazardous is going to vary. It may be acceptable to one carrier a particular class code, but then go to three others, and it's really not something that they have an appetite for. There's a real variance in um, what what they find to be acceptable, what they're comfortable with you working in. There are some industries that are universally more difficult to underwrite because you're trying to find a carrier that has an appetite both for writing business for a staffing firm and is then also comfortable with maybe a tougher industry segment such as construction, agriculture, transportation, or energy. Those are all things that are really difficult to, to line up with an insurance carrier who's also, also comfortable with the fact that you're providing staffing services and you're not just, you know, you're not a, a construction contractor. So you have to find the carrier that has those two things that actually line up that they find acceptable, and that's difficult to do in those spaces. Um, it, it's more desirable if you're in one of those spaces that you do it on a dedicated basis. So they're really not looking for you to dabble and have 5% construction payroll. You may look at that and say, well, it, it's such a small percentage of, of the overall pool of work, but in a lot of ways that actually makes them more uncomfortable with it. If, they, if you're doing something that they consider to be outside of their appetite more hazardous, they're actually more comfortable with you doing it if it's something you do on a dedicated basis, you're specialized in it, you're familiar in it, you know the safety policies, procedures, you know the work well. Um, it, there's, a, there's a different perception of specializing and really knowing a space. It gives the, um, the appearance of more control than if you just happen to be doing some work in construction, but mainly light industrial, and then you also do some work in energy as well. That's not desirable from an underwriting perspective. The number of class codes and the diversity of the work that you do is another aspect that's considered. Um, similarly to what I just talked about, about specialization, the amount of different kinds of clients you serve, the number of different clients you serve, um, all of that contributes to how comfortable or not comfortable an underwriter is with um, the work that you're performing. They may have a perception that if there are a number of different class codes that you're doing work in, and we're talking an excessive number, um, that they may look at it and say, well, do they just accept any client that walks in the door? They, what restrictions do they place internally on what work they, they find hazardous versus not hazardous? Particularly when you're looking at an amount of, a very low amount of payroll, um, in a particular class code, and it's you know maybe one or two employees, they may question how well you know that client, how well did you did you um, screen their policies and procedures and know the exposure when you only have one employee there and you've got a number of other clients and type of work that you're doing. How how well do you know what you're looking for within those particular clients when the work is so varied? And they obviously do expect variance to some degree because to a degree that's just how the industry is. If you're in light industrial, you're doing a, a variance of work, um, but they're looking for that to be still within a bound that makes them feel comfortable that you have a good handle on what your workforce is doing. They're also looking at how that payroll is distributed not just by class code, but also by client. There's a greater level of comfort with higher payroll amounts at, at a smaller number of clients than minimal payroll amounts at a large number of clients. Um, there's, an, there is again, a perception more of um, control and familiarity. If it's a client that you have a lot of employees with, there's an assumption that you're going to be out there regularly, you're going to be familiar with that client, you've walked through, you have a really good handle on what's going on there, you have, you have enough going on out there that it's a priority and it's a focus of yours, um, versus employees scattered across a very, very large pool of clients. There's, again, that concern that you may not know what's taking place at that facility, um, maybe there wasn't 
the highest level of screening that they'd like to see. So all of that kind of leads to a, a perception of how you run your business and what sort of controls you have in place. Additionally, if there is a client that um, you have a greater concentration of employees at, if you have an on-site supervisor at any of those locations, that's a, that's a huge plus to be able to say that you have someone out there on a dedicated basis and you're very familiar with what goes on. Um, because as Kurt mentioned earlier, the things that are really difficult about um, providing coverage for staffing is that, um, that sense of a, of a lack of control, of not being in that facility 24-7 and knowing exactly what's going on with your people, exactly what's taking place. They're also going to look at the length and volume of your average assignment, um, where longer-term placements are more desirable than shorter-term placements. Because employees have a far greater likelihood of being injured in the first 30 to 90 days of employment, if you have longer-term placements, there's much more of a comfort level that your employees are less likely to be, be injured because that, that initial period of time that they're working is at a substantially, substantially increased risk of injury than any of the months that follow afterwards. So if you have clients where you, maybe your average length of assignments, maybe you have employees that have been out there for years, or your employees in six to nine month assignments, it's completely different than if a large percentage of your business are, are placements that last for a handful of days or 30 days employment. That all gets viewed very differently. Uh, employee concentration is another underwriting concern. So there are um, specific types of facilities where there are incidents where multiple employees are likely to be involved in an incident. So there are some facilities that it may not be a particularly likely chance of something happen, but if something happens, there is the chance maybe of explosion or chemical exposure that influences multiple employees. Um, because when the number of employees injured in any one incident potential goes up, that greatly increases the severity for the insurance carrier. And while insurance carriers are obviously concerned with the number of losses and the, the individual losses, there's a, there's a big concern that you have a catastrophic event that affects multiple employees. Um, so some of the facilities like like that can be um, concerning. It may not be a, a, an exposure that an underwriter is willing to provide coverage for. You also run into a similar situation when it comes to terrorism concerns. Again, you're talking about does the insurance carrier have exposure for a large number of employees being injured in one incident? Um, this is particularly problematic in New York City, but it can also be a concern in um, other major metropolitan cities as well. Um, it also is difficult because beyond the insurance carrier just looking at your individual exposure. So let's say you have 20 employees in New York City. They may not be just looking at your 20 employees. The underwriter has to look at, well, what number of employees are we insuring across all of our businesses in New York City? So if you know something was to happen, what would be their maximum exposure. So that may limit it even if you only have a little bit of exposure in that area. You have similar concerns um, for group transportation arrangements. Again, we're talking about multiple employees being injured in a particular incident. We're talking about potential for severity outside of one employee being injured in one particular scenario. Um, so group transportation arrangements, even when it is not um, a vehicle that's owned or operated by the staffing firm, even if a third party is utilized, in most states, the staffing firm is in, in, involved in arranging that transportation or financially contributing towards that transportation. Instead of um, the coming and going rule applying, which normally says that um, that an injury on your way to and from work is not a worker's compensation exposure. When the employer is construed as arranging or charging for the transportation, you're taking something that wasn't a worker's compensation exposure and making it a worker's compensation exposure. 
So it takes away that coming and going role in most scenarios. Additionally, if you are talking about vans transporting employees or buses transporting employees and you have a large number of employees um, in a particular vehicle, then you're talking about a big severity concern for um, an insurance carrier um, that's now workers' compensation where it's an exposure that they didn't otherwise have to worry about. Uh, the group transportation situation is a huge hurdle towards obtaining coverage. It's very, 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 very limitedly accepted by insurance carriers. If they know about it, it's very likely to lead to a declination even beyond just consideration of, of any other aspects of your business. So what also dictates what insurance carriers might be a potential fit for you are um, minimum premium requirements um, and your premium size. So minimum premium requirements vary by carrier and the type of insurance program that you're looking at. Um, and the reason for minimum premium requirements is because at smaller premium levels, one loss is the ability to wipe out several years of profits, and you're really not tied to an insurance carrier for any more of one year. So you may have a 10-year relationship with an insurance carrier at a smaller premium and have one severe loss that may turn 10 years that were profitable for them into an overall unprofitable situation, and they may not necessarily have the chance to retain you as a, as a client on an ongoing basis and, and recoup for that loss. So many of them, um, all of them have minimum premium requirements that represents the level that they're, that they're minimally comfortable charging for premium in order to assume the, the risk of covering workers' compensation claims. Um, on a guaranteed cost basis, that minimum premium is typically at least $50,000. When you start talking about loss-sensitive programs, so programs in which you take a large deductible or there's some sort of true-up with an insurance carrier for the actual losses you have in a given year, um, those programs typically have a minimum premium nearer to $750,000 in premium. And in that situation, it's not necessarily um, the insurance carrier dictating that that's, that's the minimum premium they're willing to accept. In most cases, it's that um, it's, the quote doesn't make sense um, unless you get to that premium size because the insurance carrier is going to offer you a discounted premium in exchange for you paying losses up to a particular limit. And below a certain premium, the discount that they offer you doesn't necessarily make sense with the risk you're potentially assuming on the upside. where you wouldn't want to get $50,000 in benefit to take $400,000 of risk if things went poorly. So typically that's the level at which um, loss-sensitive programs start becoming available generally. Uh, group captive programs, which are somewhat between guaranteed costs and loss-sensitive programs, um, Group captives allow you to take um, to pool results with um, other businesses and take a limited amount of risk uh, at a lower premium size because you're pooling together several businesses to get to that size where um, where taking risk makes sense. Um, the downside of that, obviously, is that in a, a group captive program, you're also taking risk for other members' losses, not just your own. So you're not necessarily in control of the situation. Um, but it, it does allow an, an intermediate option to be able to assume some sort of risk um, for some amount of reward, so it's available to lower premium thresholds. So beyond what programs are available at a particular premium size, it's also important to look at what your individual tolerance for risk is. Um, guaranteed cost programs are typically the most conservatively priced. You don't take any risk. The insurance carrier takes the risk. And because of that, they're going to be very conservative when they're offering pricing and they're going to, to structure the program in a way where they feel very comfortable that they're going to be profitable. When you move to a loss-sensitive program and you begin taking some of the risk away from the insurance carrier, you're able to t obtain more competitive pricing. Um, 
there's improved cash flow. You may have greater flexibility in class code acceptability too because again, you're the one taking a degree of the risk. But it does require that potential upside where you may wind up paying more than you did in a guaranteed cost program. Um, and some businesses, even if they're of the size where it financially makes sense, just are not comfortable with that risk. It may not be worth it to them. Um, they may prefer to remain guaranteed costs because there's a predictability um, in knowing your cost or they're just not comfortable with the potential upside. Um, so beyond just looking at what's available, it's about making an individual decision about what's what's important for your business, what's your business comfortable with as well. Uh, and the last item we'll talk about in your operational profile that um, insurance carriers will review are Dun & Bradstreet reports and financial statements. Um, so in a guaranteed cost basis, your insurance carriers are pulling the B reports Insurance carriers are willing to take underwriting risk, risk of paying potential claims, but they're not in the business of taking financial or credit risk. So they are concerned with your ability to pay premiums to them in a guaranteed cost program. <clears throat> in a guaranteed cost program, depending on how large your premium is past a certain threshold, they, they may be, go beyond your DMB report and also want to look at your financial statements. Um, and make sure that they're comfortable with your financials and comfortable with your ability to pay them the, the premium that they're requiring for them to take the risk on um, the potential for claim payments. If you're looking at a loss sensitive program, financial statements are an absolute requirement. Um, and in a lot of situations, they, it may be required not just that you have the financial statements, but that they've been either reviewed or audited. Um, there's an increased level of financial scrutiny in loss sensitive programs because beyond just the risk of payment for premiums, the underwriter, the insurance carrier is concerned that there's a risk that you won't pay the claim obligations that you're doing. If you're taking $250,000 of risk on a given claim, they're concerned that a very large, that a large loss may happen or a number of losses may happen and you don't have the financial stability to pay for those claims that you said you would pay for because then they're on the hook for paying those claims in addition to their concern over you paying premiums. So we're going to get into some risk management practices next um, which will help differentiate yourself from the competition and from others. And we get assurance, always tell our clients the two most important things you can do in order to make sure that you have a successful workers' comp program are pick the right employees and pick the right clients. So let's talk about first about how do, how do we pick the right employees. And, and a lot of that goes to the, the screening process. Today's employment uh, environment makes this a bit more difficult with the unemployment rates dropping, the availability of, of uh, potential new employees dropping and the demand to continue to escalate for staffing services. We understand that this, there's a lot of struggles and uh, a lot of you are having difficulty recruiting good employees, but we think it's a, vitally important to not relax the hiring process, not re relax the employee selection procedures, because bad employees do breed awful workers' comp results. We see it year, year in and year out. The last time we saw workers' comp uh, losses deteriorate significantly was back in 2006 and 2007, which was a peak of the uh, of the employment cycle when unemployment rates were at historical lows and the, the talent pool was almost non-existent. People did just hire people in order to get somebody in the door so that they could fill spots and the workers' comp results for the industry as a whole deteriorated, and specifically for our staffing clients, deteriorated significantly. So what makes the best of breed for employee selection? Make sure you've got a formal applicant or application and, and interview process, if at all possible. Um, part of that is you need to understand who the employee is, what they do, and how they've done it in the past. So background checks are vitally important. Pre-employment drug testing and post-accident drug testing are a must. Uh, some of our clients have moved towards integrity testing as well. It's an interesting concept, to, uh, especially for some higher-end type placements. Uh, where you're, you're really trying to weed out those employees who are 
prone to file poor workers' comp claim, or file fraudulent workers' comp claims, potentially steal from an organization and or have uh, drug usage. Cost for integrity testing runs somewhere between $7 and about $20 per, per applicant, so it can be an expensive proposition, but when you think about the potential savings on a workers' comp program by eliminating those people with the propensity to file fraudulent claims alone, it may be worth it. Uh, Pre-employment physical exams or post-offer physical exams are also something that we recommend. It's, it becomes difficult at times to do that because the question always arises as to, okay, so we make this person an offer and it entails lifting 25 pounds individually repeatedly and the, and the uh, physical exam says that they can't do it. Now what do we do with this employee? What you're supposed to do is find another position for that employee within the organization so that they can be placed because you can't not hire them, you can't not place them solely because of the physical limitation. So that is and can be problematic at times. Uh, and also skills tests. You know, if, if you've got an employee that, that does need uh, or does require certain skills, then you can, you can have skills testing. And then uh, E-Verify. E-Verify from a, from a pre-employment standpoint is required in several states. Some insurance companies themselves require that you E-Verify because there are problems with uh, hiring undocumented workers. And, and state laws and state statutes vary but we have seen workers' comp claims be escalate quite significantly as a result of an undocumented worker being part of the employment pool. <clears throat> so for client selection, this is vital as well because not all prospects are good prospects. Uh, you need to make sure that your people come home at the end of the day with 10 fingers and 10 toes and that they're working in an overall safe environment and we preach that these employees are your employees. They are not the employees of your clients. They are yours, they're your responsibility. And you as a staffing agency should have the right and the opportunity to see those employees, to see the environment that they're working in, to interview them, to talk to them about whether or not they feel safe, that they're asked to do things that are inappropriate, et cetera. Uh, and we also are huge fans of, the, of making sure that your employees feel that they have the right to come to you if they are asked to do something that would, is normally outside of the job responsibilities or they feel unsafe. So we highly recommend uh, worksite evaluations and safety walkthroughs by you. And you could be the owner of the company, the person delivering the payroll checks, uh, the sales executive responsible for that account, or your risk manager. Somebody in the organization or several people in the organization should have accountability and responsibility to make sure your client sites are operating safely and your people are safe. Uh, we like formal processes. We'd like to see that there's documentation. We'd like to see that you're analyzing the trends too and looking at prior reports to see if anything's changed within the, within the organization and identify trends early. Uh, some companies and some, some of your clients might actually view this as a benefit and not intrusive and we've heard that many, many times before where clients, our, our staff and clients believe that it would be intrusive into the relationship with the customer. Not necessarily, you're not trying to change their processes and procedures, you're not trying to, to uh, uh, I'm sorry, but you're not trying to change their process and procedures such that it would make them less efficient and or more costly within their organization. You're trying to protect your employees and quite honestly, employee turnover is a root cause of, of there being an escalation in cost to your customer. So do it, live it, do it all the time. Um, we also recommend that, you know, on a pre-screening basis that you're constantly talking to them about their safety programs and what their training are and requiring your employees to be part of their safety processes and their, and their uh, safety training. We also advocate review of your prospects and your clients' OSHA logs, their loss runs and or their experience modifications. And if you don't know what to look for, look to your insurance company to help out. Look to your insurance broker to help out. They have the experience in, in looking at these things and they can help you determine whether or not this potential prospect, potential client of yours, is a good risk. And also look at the workers' comp class codes. Uh, that in large part determines the rate for this particular prospect of yours. Uh, it also determines what your, in large part, what your markup is going to be. And there are workers' comp codes that are purely excluded from, uh, from most insurance companies' underwriting appetites. So you need to be cognizant of that as well so that you don't get yourself into a lot of workers' comp codes that um, you know, will prohibit you potentially from seeing 
quotes from other insurance carriers. So for safety processes and, and training and orientation, uh, you need to train your employees yourselves and they need to be trained by your, uh, your customers as well. OSHA has been much more aggressive into the staffing space over the last six to nine months and they're going to continue to do so. And what they want to see is that you are providing a baseline of training for your employees and just safety orientation. There's plenty of safety videos in the marketplace. Uh, a lot of insurance companies have it. Several outsourced risk management organizations have it. Uh, we at Assurance have safety orientation training available for, for temp employees as well. And again, you want to make sure that your training is being provided by the client on an ongoing basis and that you have a, uh, you have a requirement that your employees are included in the training that's provided by your customer to their own employees. So if it's good enough for their own employees, it should be good enough for your employees as well. Uh, have a formalized safety manual and safety program for you as a staffing agency. Uh, there are templates out there. Assurance has a template, boilerplate, that can be customized to your individual company. And it's not just a matter of putting a name and a logo on a safety manual. You have to live it and breathe it. You have to be committed to it. And you need to follow your own processes and procedures in order to make that uh, a living document. And then documentation. We, again, we're fans of process and procedure here, and we want to see that there's documentation, and the underwriters want to see that there's documentation of training, that there's documentation of worksite evaluations, et cetera, so that they are comfortable that you are doing the right things. Now, ultimately, claims do occur. So what are some of the post-claim activities that, uh, that you can undertake in order to minimize the cost of the claims that do happen? We highly recommend that you investigate most accidents. You know, cuts and scrapes and bruises and those first aid types, not so much, but if anybody, if there's a serious accident, serious being somebody with um, having to go to the hospital, essentially, especially with soft tissue or, or amputations, that an accident investigation process is, is undertaken. And what you're trying to do through this is try to identify the root cause of what the accident was in order to help prevent those accidents from happening in the future. Uh, Post-accident drug testing we mentioned earlier, we want to see that the employee was not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. In some states, claims can be denied on the basis of alcohol or, or uh, drugs being present in the system. Some state statutes require that it be the proximate cause of the accident, meaning that it would not have happened if the employee was not intoxicated or under the influence. Others use it as a contributing factor. So still, document, document, document. Uh, so that you have the ability to fight claims. Usage of the uh, clinic and managed care networks. Uh, also check with your insurance company to see who their PPO agreements are with and try to util utilize those clinics and those medical providers so that you can get the benefit of the reduced insurance or the reduced claims expense associated with using a PPO network provider. We also firmly believe that the return, the formalized return to work program, getting the employees back to work as soon as possible after they are injured is a significant re, uh, impact, has a significant impact on the overall cost of a workers' comp claim. It's been documented over and over and over again by the industry that the costs run 30 to 40 percent less on a workers' comp claim if there's lost time and indemnity if the employees are returned back to work, and that is for a number of reasons. Typically, the amount of time that the employee spends um, off of work, treating is significantly less. It tends to keep claims out of the legal system uh, because the employee's not sitting at home watching television all day long or all night long because they don't have a job to get to. Uh, it also helps the employee become or feel more productive and more a contributing member of society so they're more inclined to return to work on a regular basis. And then uh, we also like our clients to keep track of their profitability and the, the performance of the workers' comp program specifically for each customer that they, that they work with. And that goes a long way to identifying where the problems ex exist and where resources within your company can be, can be allocated in order to uh, fix those issues that are underlying a, a potentially poor performing workers' comp system. So it could be that you have 100 customers and of those 100 customers, 98 of them are operating profitably and not causing any workers' comp issues, but, you know, it's the old 80-20 rule. 
80% of your claims are probably coming from 20% of your clients. So what do we do with that information? Well, there's a couple of choices you can make when you determine that there's an unprofitable client. And those choices include rehabbing the customer, working with them from a safety and loss prevention standpoint uh, in order to resurrect the account and fix the problems that are underlying it. It could be that you're going to choose that this is no longer a customer that you'd like to do business with because of the issues that are underlying the account are, are insurmountable. And we can, as brokers, exclude losses from, from customers that you have exited relationships with in certain cases. Some underwriters will look at that. Uh, some underwriters will not. But it, it's certainly worth a try. And you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can in order to keep your workers' comp program as profitable as possible. And then we're also advocates of, of you know, having a claims professional on your staff, somebody who is responsible for the day-to-day -day interaction with the claimants, the medical providers, and the workers' comp adjusters. Uh, that active management of workers' comp claims becomes imperative to, to lowering the, the costs. Uh, don't be afraid to call the adjusters. It's, they're your claims, they're your employees, somebody needs to be an advocate. And turn to your brokers as well. Uh, Assurance has several advocates on staff who job is to solely interact with our customers and the adjusters in order to minimize the cost of the claims. They become a problem solver. You're, you're, many of your brokers probably have that available as well. Use it as a resource. And then a safe, from a safety culture and, and uh, accountability standpoint, we are um, always pushing our clients to There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, communication about your safety program and communication about the importance of safety and risk management needs to be company-wide. It needs to be frequent, and it needs to be inherent in the culture of your, of your company. Uh, safety committees are an important part of it, but somebody needs to, again, own the process. There has to be somebody that, that within the organization that takes the pride of ownership of this program. And your employees need to be trained. Uh, employees, anybody client facing, anybody employee facing, should be trained on some aspects of safety and risk management because they're the ones that are in the front lines. So again, turn to your, turn to your insurance company. A lot of them have resources, and turn to your insurance broker uh, in order to get the resources you need in order to get your staff trained. Uh, safety incentive programs. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. It just it depends on the culture of the company. Uh, if anybody has questions related to what specifically does work or doesn't work, again, turn to your broker, your insurance carrier, or feel free to call us. We saved the best for, for last to talk about uh, loss history. I'm sure that most of you have a pretty decent handle on what underwriters are looking for when it comes to um, your results. So we'll start pretty basic on it and then take it a little bit more advanced um, because there may be some gaps in knowing quite exactly how an underwriter arrives at what they expect losses to be versus what we see on um, a piece of paper. So we'll start with talking about um, the loss ratio. Loss ratio is the ratio of claim payments to premium paid to the insurance carrier. So we're looking at an incurred loss ratio we're looking at the total incurred figure divided by the premium, where the total incurred is the total paid plus the total reserves. This is probably a number you're used to seeing on a loss summary. You're able to track internally by looking at your loss runs and just seeing what's paid, what's reserved, and what does that look like in comparison to um, the premium. So if you look in the exhibit below, um, we have five years of loss history laid out policy term, number of claims, total paid, total reserves added together is the total incurred. We're showing the premium for each year um, and then the loss ratio for each year. So the total incurred divided by that premium. Also showing the payroll and the loss rate, which I'll talk about on a separate slide. So I'm looking at this example, the average incurred loss rate over the five years if, excuse me, loss ratio over the five years of history is just under 55%. So what are insurance carriers looking for as far as 
them looking at a loss ratio and determining if it's profitable, if it's desirable, if they look at your loss history and it's something that, that they'd say, yes, this is an, a company that we'd like to write. They're looking for a loss ratio at or below 60%, but they're looking at it on a developed basis. So we talked about what an incurred loss ratio is. Now we'll talk about what a developed loss ratio is. A developed loss ratio is the total developed divided by the premium, where the total developed is the total incurred multiplied by a loss development factor. So you may or may not be familiar with what a loss development factor is. A loss development factor is a factor that increases the total incurred by a certain amount in order to estimate the ultimate value of the claim payment. Um, so instead of what is the loss pay at paid in reserves right now, it's what do we expect five years from now, 10 years from now, when we look back at the ultimate cost of that loss. Um, so development takes into consideration two things take into consideration the general upward trend in claim totals after the initial reporting. So, in general, if you look at all losses on an average basis, um, the amount that they are initially um, shown as incurred at, if you look at it a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, that number has a tendency to creep up over time as the loss matures, as you know more about how the situation is played out as medical complications have arisen, as attorneys are potentially involved, that amount has a tendency on the aggregate to increase over time before it hits the ultimate value that the claim will actually settle at. Um, and if you're curious, curious to see um, how that actually plays out in, in action, I'd encourage you look at your lost runs and pull a version of them from a year ago if you have them on file and look at the differences in individual claims and individual totals on the whole. Look at them over a period of years and see what happened to the number for a given year as you tracked it a year out, two years out, three years out. Development is also including a factor that takes into consideration um, claims that are incurred but not reported, which we abbreviate as IBNR. So claims that have occurred that may or may not have been reported to you. They may be injuries you're aware of, injuries you're not aware of, things that initially seemed where there was an incident but no medical treatment was sought, that two years down the line, someone may get an attorney and file a claim six months down the line, claim that there was um, you know, an injury that was never brought to your attention. The so loss development factors vary significantly based on the state and on the age of the claim. So more recent claims have a higher factor than older claims. The older a claim is, the closer it is to its, its ultimate value. It's matured, you've gone through most of the process, the amount shown is very close to what the ultimate amount is. The newer the claim is, the more uncertainty there is. The, the more likelihood that the amount is going to increase over time. So when you're looking at loss development factors for newer years, they're significantly higher than older years, and especially high in the current policy year. And then certain states have far higher loss development factors than the countrywide averages. Some are obviously lower, but there are some states that are particular standouts that have that could be two to three times higher what you may see um, in an average state. So we looked at the loss summary on the slide before on an incurred basis, and we were looking at a 55% loss ratio, which looking at you may have thought, all right, this, this looks pretty decent, 55%. That's not a bad ratio to see um, from an underwriting perspective. So now knowing that an insurance carrier is looking for 60% on a developed basis. That's the point at which they break even um, in looking at the amount that they pay out in claims and then the support for all of their other costs, such as purchasing reinsurance, paying for staff, paying for claims adjusters, everything that is entailed in running the business. So if we look at that same ratio, we still have the incurred loss ratio at just under 55%, but when we take into account the column just after incurred, where we show the loss development, in the current year, the, the most recent year, that loss development factor is 1.757%. So we're increasing the amount of 
the incurred amount by 75.7% over what's shown to get at the developed number, which is what the underwriters expect you to have ultimately. Again, when you're looking back at things 10 years down the line, you're going back and you're looking at the results. That's how much on average, and these are countrywide averages, they expect those claims to increase. And you'll see that that number goes backwards, um, decreases the further back we go in time. So there's less development applied as you go further and further back because those, those claims are, in general, many of them may be closed out and unable even to be reopened. They may be heading towards their ultimate amount. So if you look at the developed loss ratio, you're actually looking at just under 72%. So when you see a summary that shows it at 55%, an underwriter takes that information, develops it, and they see a 72% loss ratio. And worse, in the example that we're showing, they're seeing that the loss ratio is going up. It's, it's increasing in the more recent years over what it's been at historically. So this would be, um, this would be difficult to underwrite without some explanation as to what was taking place specific to the claims, why it was happening, and it may not have been something where looking at it you would think would potentially be a concern. So I have a second example loss summary. Um, this is an example in which there was a $750,000 loss in um, the middle policy year, the, the um, 2012 policy year. If we look at the incurred loss ratio, we're already at 76%. And then when we develop it, we're at 94%. So looking at this loss ratio, would you think that this is necessarily more difficult to, um, to underwrite than the summary we looked at previously? The developed loss ratio is certainly higher. It's certainly on the, the whole for that time period more unprofitable to the insurance carrier than the prior example. But this is actually a far easier scenario to get underwritten. If you look at the other four years, you have developed loss ratios somewhere between 30 and 35%, which are profitable ratios. They're consistent ratios. An underwriter can say, all right, this is what we would expect in an average year. There was one incident that was really substantially outside of what we expected. But if we're able to look at that incident, and, and have an explanation as to what went wrong, and more importantly, how it was addressed, what's going to prevent that sort of incident from happening in the future. This is a far easier underwriting scenario than looking at something where on the average, nothing out of line has happened, but it's just been slightly unprofitable to the insurance carrier. When we're looking at loss-sensitive programs, um, so non-guaranteed cost programs, and some larger premium guaranteed cost policies, um, underwriters are less focused on that loss ratio, and they're more focused on loss rate. So where loss ratio looks at the claims dollars versus the premium paid, loss rates are looking at the claims dollars versus the payroll. So the developed loss rate takes the total developed and it divides it by payroll over $100. Um, so if you look at the example below, um, the developed loss rate is $3.06 in the example. So what the developed loss rate represents is the historical amount of claims that have occurred per $100 of payroll which is used as the insurance company's expectation of what they expect in the future. So an insurance carrier takes that loss rate and they then develop what we refer to as a loss pick, which is the expected amount of losses. So the loss pick just simply takes the payroll that you're projecting for the, for the policy term that they're looking at, divides it by $100, and multiplies it times the loss rate. So in the same example we saw on the prior slide, at a developed loss rate of $3.06 and a projected payroll of $22 million, to get your loss pick, you divide the $22 million by $100 and then multiply it by $3.06 
to get an expected amount of losses of $673,000 and $200. So if you're on a guaranteed cost program, the underwriter is then going to look to set premium at a level that supports the expected loss pick. So depending on how conservative the insurance carrier is, um, what state they're in, they're going to take that loss amount and aim to put a premium together that means that that loss amount would be somewhere between 45% to 70% of the premium because um, they're trying to get to a level of profitability. In a hard market, that number is somewhere between 45%, 50%, 52%. When the market softens, we saw insurance carriers underwriting to closer to 70%. They got more aggressive on pricing even when they still had the same amount of expected losses. If you're on a loss-sensitive program um, where you're taking risk and paying claims, uh, the insurance carrier is going to look to have either a letter of credit or cash to collateralize what that expected loss pick is. So if you have $673,000 in expected losses, they're going to be looking for cash in that amount or an LLC posted in that amount that supports your payment of that amount of losses. Uh, so beyond just looking at loss ratios and loss rates, there's a lot of other um, details that are that are looked at um, in your individual loss history. So some additional things that may cause concerns to underwriters are a high frequency rate. Um, the amount that that's taken into account is really varies by insurance carrier. Some are very very um, heavy on looking at um, frequency rates that can disqualify um, a submission for them. And some carriers are less concerned with it. Um, you actually also have a problem on the opposite end of the spectrum where you could have too few losses shown on the, the loss summary or not enough medical-only losses showing. And that's a situation that leads underwriters to assume that, um, that claims may not all be being reported to them, that you may be self-paying claims to a degree, um, which does happen, but insurance carriers don't necessarily like it happen. So they'll hold you accountable for high frequency, but at the same time, they'll be concerned if they're not seeing um, the, the smaller losses. Also going to look at the type of injuries that are occurring, even if there aren't necessarily huge dollar amounts associated with them. If there are types of claims that are concerning that they know are claims that very easily could um, types of injuries that could result in very, very substantial claims dollars. Even if the amounts aren't necessarily there, there may still be some concern and a need for explanation of what, why those sort of injuries have occurred. Um, and then I talked about it briefly earlier, the look at the trend. Are results improving or deteriorating? You may have a higher average over the past five years than is desirable, but maybe things were really bad in the oldest two years. You made some huge changes in your risk management program and everything's heading in the right direction. Results have improved. Um, that gets factored in. There's also a lot of analysis that can be done um, to make the loss history look better to an insurance carrier and have them expect um, less losses. So highlighting the impact of severity claims in the example where we, we talked about the $750,000 loss, we'd want to show that loss summary without that claim, too, to highlight how profitable the account would have been without that one injury, and then provide information on what was done after that injury, how it was addressed, and what would prevent it from, from happening in the future to get the underwriter comfortable that it shouldn't happen again. Um, Kurt mentioned it earlier, there's analysis that can be done on claims by client, and you should be tracking profitability of, um, of your clients, looking at their claims, looking at their claims versus the amount of payroll that you run with them and what's expected um, based on the class code you're doing work in. This is something your broker should be able to assist you with, and you should be tracking and monitoring so that you can see if a client is running out of line and adversely affecting your results. And it is something where if you've terminated unprofitable clients, that can be used um, to, to paint a better picture of what expected <clears throat> loss results will be and what pricing should be set at. So I know we threw a lot of information out there about 
potential hurdles. This is not meant to say that you're meant to be um, the perfect company. Nobody's the perfect company. But our hope is that in highlighting potential areas of concern, you know what things to highlight in presenting your business to an insurance carrier, what things you're doing well that you want them to know about, things that are a concern that you may not have known there's a concern that you may be able to make modifications to or, or isolate to a degree or a, a practice you may be able to see. So I, I hope we've demystified the process a little bit. Um, but with that, we'll uh, open it up to questions. Okay, fantastic. I do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, the first question is, are there legal obligations for a client to allow a post-accident investigation? What recourse does the staffing company have when a client refuses to let our safety manager on site or the workers' comp insurance investigator on site after a major incident? Um, if there is a lawsuit filed in this particular case, the courts may be able to order uh, somebody be able to see it, especially if there's a third-party suit by the employee against the client company. In a normal workers' comp situation, it, there's no legal obligation to allow any third party on site uh, that we're aware of, We've, except in the cases where it is court-ordered. So it would have to be through the legal process that that was entailed or that that, that was accomplished. Well, in, in an area we've seen be successful that some of our clients are doing is spelling out in their contracts that that is required of the client company, that we be required to come in and monitor what our employers are doing. We be required to conduct an accident investigation. You allow our insurance carrier on site in the event that there's an, an injury. So a lot of... Um, some of our clients are setting that expectation up front, and that's been helpful. Great. Um, what states are most difficult to write workers' compensation coverage for? Uh, I would say California is incredibly difficult. New York is incredibly difficult. Um, states like Wisconsin can be difficult actually just because of the lack of pricing flexibility, although that's a, that's a great state for actual workers' compensation results. You run into a lot of issues in, in the Northeast in general. Um, Connecticut's difficult, Massachusetts is difficult, New Jersey is difficult, um, Illinois is a difficult state for workers' compensation. Uh, those are some of them, but there, there's just that always that variance of what are they allowed to do with pricing, what do the state statutes allow them to do with claims, and what have they actually seen result-wise. I would say California and New York are probably the two worst. Okay. What are underwriters looking for when looking at financials? All right. They typically are looking for uh, stability. So as Carrie mentioned earlier, they're willing to take insurance risk, but they don't want to take credit risk. So it's more of a balance sheet review than it is a P&L review. So they look at, it's a lot of ratio analysis, things such as the debt to equity ratio, the current ratio. Um, they're looking for growth in retained earnings and, and stockholders' equity. Uh, they prefer to see a statement of cash flow to see that the business is actually generating cash instead of using cash. And I know in the staffing industry right now is going through a pretty aggressive growth. So the, the, the cash flow statements don't look so good because you typically are using a lot of cash in your business in order to continue to fund your growth. Um, from a P&L standpoint, they, they don't want to see necessarily that they're, they don't want to look at the individual expenditures on the P&L. They don't care so much about the revenues, but they do care about the bottom line. Uh, they want to make sure that the company is operating profitable. But really, P&L, that's all they're looking for. The, the main concerns are balance sheet stability, and they want to see that you're going to be in business for the next five to ten years. So I know a lot of companies will strip earnings out of the business, uh, especially LLCs, since you're, since you're putting those on the personal tax returns anyways. But it, it's somewhat detrimental to the overall financial strength of the business from a stability standpoint when there's not enough retained earnings. Uh, staffing agencies are very capital poor, and really the only capital you have, the only assets you have are, are your receivables. So 
it, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. The underwriters also, their credit people aren't used to or accustomed to seeing uh, financials from staffing agencies. They're, they're accustomed to seeing financials for large manufacturers that have a pretty significant capital base and a large, a large uh, uh, pool of assets. So it's an education process for underwriters and their credit folks as well. And a lot of the thing, a lot of the time we spend, I mean, we spend a lot of time on the phone with credit analysts at the insurance carrier level, helping them understand the staffing agency's financials. So it's a, it's a yep. much different process to look at financials for staffing versus more capital intensive businesses. Okay. The next question I have is, in Louisiana, I'm finding that it's not an employer-friendly state. What recourse does an agency have if the temp employee will not follow proper protocol after an accident? I think it depends on what we're talking about as far as proper protocol. And I don't know if we're familiar enough with the individual state statutes in Louisiana. Um, Whoever asked that question, if, if they want to contact yeah, Carrier contact, Me individually, yeah. we can do a little research on your behalf uh, through our claims advocacy team. They may have specific uh, knowledge of, of what we can and can't do. Yeah. I mean, typically we tell our employees, there's a, if, as long as you have a progressive discipline pro process, program in place and you're continuing down the progressive discipline, then you can terminate for, for a violation of safety uh, procedures in most cases. So feel free to reach out to Carrier Eye. We yes, maybe I'll help you more individually with that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, this, here's another question. Should we be requiring workers' compensation coverage of independent contractors or subcontractors, even if they have no employees other than worker? Uh, yes, we would recommend that you do that, and the reason for that is because if you do have an uninsured independent contractor or an uninsured subcontractor, there's a possibility that um, their workers' compensation injury or the workers' compensation injury of their employee um, could be a workers' compensation claim for you. And I apologize, I'm blanking on the term for what those employees are, what those employees of the contractor are. Um, referred to as, but it's very specific that, yes, it could be your workers' compensation responsibility. And that can actually get kind of complicated because I know in some states, um, depending on the state, uh, employers with less than a certain number of employees aren't required to have workers' compensation coverage, so they may not have it right now, but if you hire them, you may still wind up with a workers' compensation claim from one of their employees. So we would definitely recommend that you require them to have it. Okay, and just a follow-up to the Louisiana question about an employee not following protocol. Uh, the temp employee drove straight to an attorney's office and not to our office so we could assist in doctor's appointments and drug testing after the accident. Mm -hmm. What recourse sure. does the agency have? Um, and, and I'll go ahead and put up the contact information here, too, if, if um, that could be a side conversation if need be. Yeah, re reach out to us as a side conversation, and we'll loop in one of our um, claims advocates to talk specifically about what can be done with that in Louisiana. If there's just yeah. a lot of variance from state to state, it's not something I know off the top of my head. Okay. Another question, what do you suggest when you have a claim in which you cannot get cooperation from the doctors and or adjusters to change a treatment course when the course has been going on for more than seven months and is not working? In Virginia, second options are not considered if they do not agree with treating, the treating physician and information that was received. I don't know what you can do with that. Yeah, I mean, we typically recommend an independent medical exam, and I'm not um, intimate enough with the Virginia statute to know that if an IME is an acceptable form of second opinion in order to change the course, um, the course of treatment. Again, it, it may be something that Carrie and I would need to research independently and, and reach out to our claims team to find out. And again, whoever asked that question, if they want to just shoot carry our email and, and we can get you an answer on that pretty quickly. Great. Uh, I have another question here. What are some key points for PEOs obtaining, attempting to claim, obtain policies for staffing agencies? 
So if that question is coming from a PEO itself, it, the PEO underwriting world is actually much more difficult than the, than the underwriting world for staffing agencies. It's, um, it, it, there are the same risks associated with, with PEOs as there are with staffing. However, there seems to be a bit more uh, reputational risk and credit risk that the insurance companies are concerned with uh, because of the very public bankruptcies and restructurings of the PEO world. So we tend to go through a lot of the same underwriting that we go through for our staffing clients with our PEO clients, except that the underwriting universe, those insurance companies as a whole that will write, underwrite that class of business is significantly less. Now, if the question is coming from a staffing agency who is potentially looking at a PEO as a means of providing workers' comp coverage, it's a, yeah, it's a, different, it's a different story. And while people do do it, there are a host of other problems that go along with using a PEO to underwrite your workers' comp coverage, including the loss of an individual uh, workers' comp history, potentially taking deductible program, deductibles, uh, the payment of additional fees for administration expenses, the lack of control over uh, potentially hiring, firing, the loss of um, uh, <clears throat> uh, decision-making authority. Well, and you also have potential, Kurt was talking about the marketplace being really limited. There are very, very, very few insurance carriers who are, will allow a PEO to take a staffing um, client on. So a lot of the times where that's happening, the insurance carrier doesn't actually know that that's the arrangement. The insurance carrier may see the end client as being the client and not actually even understand that the, the staffing firm is the actual client of the PEO, which in, can create further complications as far as um, claims handling and just kind of the integrity of, of that being a workers' compensation option. And that would be a whole other hour-long webinar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do one last question here because I know we're running a little late. Um, but are class codes with lower rates considered safer than class codes with higher rates? Um, the, that's sort of a yes and a no. Um, so when you're looking at the, the rate associated with the class code, the lower rate means, on the whole, the amount of claims dollars associated with it on average across all payroll is lower than a higher rated class code. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a lower, lower risk uh, type of classification. Most typically, um, where you still see concern with lower rated class codes is where you have a type of work where there's not a frequency concern, but there's a severity concern. So you may go five years with close to nothing happening, but when you do have an incident, it's likely to be a really, really severe incident. So if you average it out, it's relatively low, um, low rated, but the risk in an individual year could be significant. So you may still have exposure concerns there. It's just not necessarily in the aggregate on the whole over years and years and years. Okay. Well, with that, I'll wrap things up. I'd like to thank our presenters today and all of our attendees for taking the time out of their day to attend the webinar. Um, Kurt and Carrie, uh, specifically, thank you for sharing all the knowledge you have on workers' compensation. If anyone else has any other questions, um, please feel free to email either Kurt or Carrie directly. They'd be happy to answer them for you. Um, we will have a recording of today's session that will be available on our website at tricom.com. Um, it is under the Resources tab in the Industry Insider Webinars section. Thank you again for your participation, and I hope you guys have a great day.